then we can. And hopefully after tonight, no more adventures with the projector. Bill, here you go. Thank you. Okay, well, sorry, you can't see the slides quite yet, but uh, I'll make sure you see the important ones. Um, thanks for the introduction. <laughs> I'd sure like to meet that fellow. <laughs> In fact, uh, Phil had asked me to give a, uh, a talk on the China study, and we, um, I'm going to give it a talk based loosely on the China study. I mean, we do the same approach. It's the ecologic approach where you compare uh, the diets of various countries, uh, the diseases of various countries, and try to figure out what causes what. We still have a few copies left at $20 a piece. Uh, I don't know if, I also have a handout which uh, you may, well, that's on the table here in case you didn't pick that up. So my revised title tonight is National Diets and National Diseases, a Stroll Through the Data, Recent Publications, and my latest research. And I'll be discussing epidemiologic studies uh, and causality. And we've had an email discussion about what, what, uh, when can you claim causality um, in a study? What does it take to really say this causes that? Uh, I'll talk about national diets and, and how they arise. Talk about genetics and its relation to diet and disease. Uh, then I'll discuss briefly the China study. Uh, then I'll get into my research on Alzheimer's disease, coronary heart disease, and cancer. Then go on to comparing uh, global health statistics looking at geopolitical regions like Africa, the Middle East, China, and looking at what they eat and, and what their diseases are. Then I'm going to get over and, and discuss Michael Pollan's new book, The, the Omnivore's Dilemma. Uh, he's a journalist professor at Berkeley, and you, you may have seen the book reviews in the Chronicle and, and elsewhere. Uh, he's a 51-year-old journalist who, who's written quite a bit for the New York Times uh, Sunday magazine, and he's, he's really put his pulse on, on the, the uh, finger on the pulse of, of what's causing obesity and what's wrong with the American um, uh, system. And then finally, I'll uh, give a uh, latest update on vitamin D and cancer. Now, some of this is, is material I've presented here before, but I see about half the faces or more or I haven't heard my talk, so, uh, and for the other, it might be a refresher course, and, and I've certainly push things forward, so um, you, you'll, um, uh, you'll learn something from this. Um, I, in, in terms of a little bit more background, I, I was introduced to the ecologic approach back in the early 90s when I was studying the effects of acid rain and ozone on the eastern hardwood forests. This was a project for the Sierra Club, and I, I learned how to map um, disease uh, status and, and stressors. In this case, it was oak decline, oak forest decline, and oak mortality versus acid rain and ozone by state. And it's just doing statistics then and finding correlations. Uh, but um, as I found out when I took it to the Forest Service, they said, well, you haven't um, looked at all the other factors, um, insects, fungal diseases, uh, what have you. And so we can't accept the findings. And, and um, I was sort of chest fallen because I spent a lot of time on it, but it hadn't um, reached the level of scientific acceptability that they required. But about that time, uh, when I was in New Zealand on one of my NASA trips, I read that Japanese American men in Hawaii had two and a half times as much Alzheimer's disease as native Japanese. Now, I knew that people with Alzheimer's had more aluminum in their brains. Uh, my mother had Alzheimer's at the time, so I was tuning into that. And knew that when you put more acid into the forest <coughs> soils, it dissolved the, the aluminum oxides and made the aluminum available to the forest soil and forest trees. It also leached out the calcium and magnesium because it lowered the pH and it was trying to be neutralized. And it also dissolved the transition metal ion oxides, uh, iron oxide, uh, zinc, uh, mercury, whatever. And so I figured, well, um, since um, Aluminum is involved in both cases, I'll just use, and, and, and since the diet is the most important uh, part of the human environment in terms of what gets into the body, I'll just do an ecologic study on, on diet and, and, and prevalence of Alzheimer's around the world. And was able to find uh, the links, and I'll talk to you about, about that a little bit later. Um, as I went, uh, also, I, many members of my family had the Western chronic diseases, and I wanted to make sure that 
that they weren't just genetically predetermined, that, and that they, if they had an environmental cause, that I could find out what it was and avoid the traps that they fell into. Um, and then I also realized that our, our, our disease treatment system in America, it's not really a health system, it's more of a disease treatment system, uh, really wasn't as interested in preventing diseases as it was in treating them. So it turns out there was a whole, whole field that was sort of sparsely populated because the money wasn't there and still isn't there. Okay, now uh, I'm involved in what's called epidemiology. And that is a study of patterns, causes, and control of disease in groups of people. You hear about the flu and influenza epidemic, or the a HIV epidemic, the AIDS epidemic, the this epidemic. Well, that's when you have large numbers of people having particular diseases. But the whole study of looking at, well, you know, where are they, what's the population distribution, where are there more and fewer cases, then you can start trying to find out, well, what's correlated with these uh, different uh, uh, levels of disease. And there are three primary ways that are used in epidemiologic studies. One is the case control approach, which compares disease with healthy people who have otherwise similar characteristics and trying to look for what the difference is in their background and their risk factors. Second is the cohort study, where you follow a de defined group for years, questioning them every year or two what they're eating and how their health is. The best one, known ones in America are the nurses' health study out of Harvard and the physicians' health study out of Harvard, the one that uh, Ed Giovannucci and Walter Willett are so intimately involved with. And uh, then you have the ecologic approach, which you use populations defined geographically. You compare disease outcome, outcomes with risk-modifying factors. Now, each of these approaches has strengths and weaknesses. Uh, the first two are very expensive and very time-consuming. Um, the, the, the first one, the case control uses, well, both the case control and the cohort use questionnaires on diet. And the questionnaires are being called more and more into question. Uh, many times people, I think it was brought out in, in the Women's Health Study recently. Uh, yeah, it was um, Marian Nessel, who was at Berkeley for, for this last semester. She said she looked at, at the average weight of the women involved was 175 pounds, and their average caloric intake was like 1,700 calories. No way could that be a match. So people were, were hiding what they're eating. And so, you know, it's hard to, to really try to figure out what people are eating if they're not going to tell you. Um, uh, and the other problem with the cohort study uh, that, that both um, Cole and Campbell and I argue with them about is that if all of the people in the study are eating the same American diet, you just don't have enough variation to pick up the major risk factors. So for years, Walter has been questioning whether animal fat and, and animal products have any role to play in breast cancer because his nurse's health study couldn't find it, as if that's the gold standard. Well, I mean, all I have to do is compare Korea and Japan with the United States and Europe, and you see there's a, a tremendous difference, and they have different diet, and you can, by carefully analyzing the diets, find out what the, what the differences are. So the ecologic studies are the easiest to perform, and they have the advantages of large differences uh, between populations. Unfortunately, they're not that highly regarded among the health community. Um, so there's a, a problem in, in, in perception there. Now, um, in terms of causality, um, observational studies cannot by, by themselves be used to ascertain causality, uh, but they can open the door to further studies. And I might mention my first ecologic study I did in, back in the 70s when I was living, working down here at, at SRI International. I noticed that there was a high correlation between the per capita ownership of TVs and the divorce rate in America. You just plot them side by side and you see they go up together. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I'm more sh I think that the real explanation is that with increasing affluence, one could afford a TV and a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> Not that the divorce was, of course, that actually in the Bay Guardian they published, they actually published this letter in the Bay Guardian as TV as correspondent. Um, but A. Bradford Hill, um, who was the, the president of the Royal Medical Society in England in his presidential address in 1965 said, well, uh, there, there are a number of ways you can ascertain causality in a bio biological system. First thing you want to find is strong associations. And that's what we do with these statistical correlations between diet and disease or whatever. The second thing you want to find is similar uh, uh, results in different populations. You find it one population but on another, well, then you don't understand what's going on. 
Third thing you want to do is rule out confounding factors. You want to, like with the forest, was it the insects, was it the fungal diseases, was it stand dynamics, was it drought, um, or was it air pollution? Without examining all of them, you can't really say it's the one you think it is. And fourth, it helps to identify the mechanisms. Um, and uh, that, that goes uh, a long way towards um, saying that, yes, if you have a link between A and B, that there's a, a process that goes from A to B. And then finally, y it helps if you generally find a linear dose-response relationship. In other words, if, if you have a population of 1,000 people, they, they, if they, you take those drink one glass of, uh, smoke one pack a day, those that t smoke two packs a day, and so on, the more packs a day they smoke, uh, you expect to find more lung cancer in, in, the, in the groups. That's a sort of linear dose-response relationship. Um, okay, now, uh, origin of national diets. Uh, I guess most people just sort of accept the diet of the country they live in without really questioning, well, why are we eating what we're eating? If you're raised in Japan, you eat rice and a little bit of seafood and some vegetables and tofu and, and so on. If you're in America, you eat hamburgers and hot dogs and and drink coffee and, and whatever. Well, it turns out there are a number of reasons that, that diets arise nationally. For one, you have uh, the, the foodstuffs that are normally available in the um, various countries. Um, if you're on an island in the Pacific, you might have coconuts and fish, and, and, um, but you're not going to have cows and hamburgers and hot dogs. Um, if you um, live in the um, uh, well, uh, you, go, uh, you know, in the tropics you have fruit you can pick. In the polar regions you have uh, um, walruses and the fish. Now, another thing that affects your diet is the climate. Uh, in the Nordic areas, they had to have the fish in the old days to get their vitamin D. Because polar to 60 degrees, you can't make vitamin D enough during the year to really exist uh, and be healthy. Um, but it also turns out, several thousand years ago, when they brought cows to the... Um, you have to do the magic to see. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they brought cows in. It turns out that those people who became lactose tolerant could survive the winter because they could drink the milk from the hay that was stored during the year. Uh, and so, at, at a rate of a few percent per year, the Nordic people became lactose tolerant. Uh, whereas down in the, the Mediterranean area, the, the, the Egypt and so on, where, they, where grain originated, um, they were glucose tolerant and um, uh, gluten tolerant. Yeah, gluten tolerant, sorry. Uh, and more likely they weren't, didn't have to have lactose in diet, so they were lactose intolerant. Whereas up in the Nordic countries, they turned out to, had, had turned out to be a gluten intolerant and lactose tolerant. So we have this sort of dichotomy in, in Europe. And I think that if you have uh, parents, one from the Nordic country, one from, say, Italy or someplace, to have offspring, they could be one or the other. I mean, they may not inherit all of the, the, the um, tolerances. Okay, so um, then you have um, diets that introdu introduced by an outside culture, such as our Western culture introducing hamburgers to, uh, and cows and so on to China now, and, and quite a few other places. Then you have changes due to economic considerations. Uh, genes, thank you very much. The genes play a very important role uh, in, in ethnic um, differences. I mentioned the Southern Northern Europeans. There's also an interesting thing about the, um, the, the genes that, that um, handle lipid metabolism, um, APOE, uh, alpha, um, a lipoprotein, uh, I forget what it is, APOE, but anyway. Uh, it turns out there's, uh, they have three uh, uh, alleles, three different varieties, uh, two, three, and four. And the epsilon four is the, uh, the thrifty gene. And this uh, facilitates storing of excess food as fat. Uh, and it turns out it's three times more prevalent among the hunter-gatherers uh, than those among the sedentary grain farmers. So the uh, Africans and the Inuits might have 30, 35% prevalence whereas your, your, uh, southern, uh, your Medi southern Mediterraneans might have 10% and the Asians would have 10%. And it turns out it's also a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and for cancer and for other diseases. Um, I think part of the problem with black Americans is they are, have a high preponderance of uh, epsilon-4 and so when they eat the junk food they just get fat a lot easier than uh, Caucasians and certainly than Asians. 
Uh, one can study uh, immigrants uh, and dietary changes to see how diet affects um, uh, health. Um, it, there are a number of studies looking at the different successive generations of, say, Japanese, looking at breast cancer rates and, and, and so on as they come in. Successive generations bec become um, more assimilated, uh, more acculturated, and are eating more of the hot dogs, hamburgers, and so on. Uh, and, and the disease rates for all these related uh, 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 chronic diseases go up. It's also possible to study the disease changes in a country when it changes its diet, and I'll get into some of those studies a little bit later in the talk. <coughs> One kind of question I've had in the back of my mind for years, and I'm beginning to think the answer is no, is is, is there an optimal global diet? I mean, is there a, a, a diet you can say is the best all-around diet and everybody should be on this diet? Uh, one that would give the best health and welfare outcome for everyone. And I think the reason is no, the answer is no, because different populations face different challenges. Uh, workload, uh, thermal environments, you're in the polar region, the tropical regions, uh, local food production, funds available, whether you need your vitamin D from, from the local food like the seafood, whether you get it from sunlight. So um, uh, I think the, um, uh, there's a lot of variation. And, and um, I like what Phil says here. If we, if we look at, see, in doing the ecologic studies, the reason it doesn't cost anything is because the data have been harvested. They, they have disease statistics by country, dietary data by country. So as Phil says, this is really a triple blind study. Neither the doctors nor the patients know they're involved in a study. And so somebody from beyond who's sort of harvesting that and putting into the mixer and trying to find out what's, what's happening. Now, uh, T. Colin Campbell um, wrote the China study based on his research as well as that of many others. And he generally used the ecologic approach. Uh, he's 75 years old now and still going strong. He's the emeritus professor at Cornell. I've heard him several times, several, I think Mike Corrick and, and some of the others. I was heard when he came down to the Macrobiotic Society uh, meeting in, was it February? Uh, his, his major uh, research program was actually a, a study in China uh, of 200 people in each of 69 counties. Um, he had a visiting uh, uh, associate pr research professor in Cornell who told him that once Chu and Lai got cancer, he sent 650,000 people into the countryside to document the cancer rates throughout China. And uh, so there's a tremendous database uh, of information. And so anyway, they, they sort of plugged into that and came up with their own study which is to go to these 69 counties, two cities per county, interview 100 people uh, between up to the age of 64, and try to find out what they're eating, what's in their blood, what's in their urine, uh, and how's their health. And um, it's a thick book, I have it, and it, I'm using it for some research. It's, it's quite a good uh, tome. Uh, now, he was raised on a dairy farm, as was my mother and probably other people around here, or parents, or whatever. Uh, but he's going to become a, a vegan based on his research findings. And let me say, I'm not going to uh, argue that the vegan approach is the best approach. Uh, I, I'm going to be presenting what I'm finding from various countries, and you can see sort of what, what's linked to what. But what he, he's dismayed to learn that when they were trying to bridge the protein gap in the Philippines in the 60s, that children as young as four years old were developing liver cancer when they were fed cow's milk. And through thinking about it in laboratory studies with rats, they found out that casein, which is the primary milk protein, destroyed an enzyme in the liver that detoxified aflatoxin, which is endemic in a hot, humid climate. And uh, so they were you know, trying to introduce a Western diet to a tropical country, it just had ramifications they hadn't thought of at the time. So it goes to show that you can't just take a diet that works one place uh, and export it to another. <coughs> Possibly. Steve? Do you know if that milk was produced in, in, in indigenously or whether it was brought in from outside or whether it was dried and reconstituted? Do you know if there was, do you know anything about that? No, I don't. But I know if, for the rats, I'm pretty sure it was American milk fed to American rats, and they had the same result. Do you know if it was homogenized? I don't know. I, 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 got access to papers, I could, I could, I'll look at, try to look into that. Uh, one thing, uh, um, one thing, 
Colin Campbell and John McDougall and Neil Barnard try to hammer home that it is that milk is not a health food. And I don't want to go into it in much detail, but um, I mean, it was important for survival in the Nordic countries. On the other hand, there are a number of uh, diseases and, and, and conditions that are linked to drinking milk uh, in our country. It's often shown, my study and Ed Giovannucci's study at Harvard and other studies, um, June Chan at San SF State, uh, UCSF, have shown that milk consumption is a high risk factor for, for prostate cancer. Back around 1999, when Giuliani had, had prostate cancer, I mentioned to the people at PETA that milk was a risk factor, so they put up a billboard in, in Wisconsin, had Giuliani <coughs> with a picture with a milk mustache, and said, got prostate cancer. <laughs> <laughs> he got terribly offended, and um, the upshot was that, that they had not asked his permission, so they just took it down, and that was the end of it. But uh, uh, there's a high correlation. It's not quite clear what, what portion of milk is the risk factor. Uh, some studies find that calcium is a risk factor for prostate cancer. Others find it is not a risk factor. I tend to think it's the fat or the protein, but I think the jury's still out on that. As far as calcium goes, milk has a lot of protein and a lot of fat, both of which sort of suck up the calcium. And so calcium, the milk is not an especially good source of, of calcium in the diet. Um, it's a good, like in the forest uh, soils, it's, it's, it's trying to balance out the pH. Uh, in this book, he shows a graph showing the hip fracture rates are highly correlated with the amount of milk consumed per country. You have much higher hip fracture rates in Sweden and Norway than you do in Japan, for example. Yes? What, what would be the play on raw milk versus homogenized and pasteurized milk? Uh, they're, they're different milks. Yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't investigated that. Uh, maybe we discuss that later, but I, that's. And, and also, with regards to hip fractures in milk, I mean, what what is the other supporting information about the necessary minerals that are part of those dietary environments, which could grossly affect <coughs> the hip? Yeah, I'd like to hold the discussion down now as we go uh, and we come at the end, and maybe get some other people involved in, in answering these questions that I can't answer so well. Um, Number, some studies have shown that type 1 diabetes in children is linked to milk consumption. A heart study out of Harvard has shown uh, teenage acne associated with milk. Other people have inflammatory responses to milk. So, um, I mean, a lot of people are lactose intolerant as well. Uh, the other thing he goes into is, is the, the, the comparing um, disease rates for, for the amount, the fraction of energy uh, derived from animal products respect, with respect to plant-based uh, products. Uh, again, bone fractures are often higher, kidney stones are often higher, uh, breast cancer. Uh, he shows that it's, it's um, the more animal products in diet, uh, the more e lifetime estrogen uh, for a woman. Earlier, um, uh, menzies, uh, uh, just a longer, uh, more estrogen during the whole life cycle. Um, colon cancer is very strongly linked to meat and animal products. Heart disease linked to um, um, animal products, the animal fat. But sugar is also uh, correlated with, with coronary heart disease. So um, there's a lot of the wealth of information in the book, uh, which I recommend. But now I'd like to turn to um, my own studies, which I understand a little bit better. Uh, I mentioned the part about Alzheimer's disease, how I got started in this study. And um, I got data for 11 countries um, uh, and, and, and got the, just very naively, it was my first uh, foray into diet and disease. And I recall the paper by Armstrong and Dahl from 19, Bruce Armstrong and Richard Dahl, who in 1975 did a lot of studies which are uh, summarized in, in the China study. And they correlated uh, animal protein, animal fat with many cancers. Um, and so I thought, well, that's a good way to, to try to do this study. Um, so what I found was that it was high total fat and high total energy or total calories were the, in, the, the high risk factors whereas fish uh, consumption and cereals uh, reduce the risk. Now, what the fat and calories do is, is, like Phil said, increase oxidative stress. What the fish does is it fights inflammation. Also, the fish oils, DHA and EPA, are very important for the, for the brain. Uh, they, they, um, <coughs> they're the fats that, that help build the strong brain. So it seems like there are two effects there. Now, uh, in terms of the, the uh, trace minerals, uh, the University of Kentucky, which published this paper in 1997, 
had done some uh, looking at autopsies of, of brains, people with Alzheimer's, and they found that all of the transition metal ions, mercury, zinc, uh, copper, uh, iron, were all elevated in the brains of people with Alzheimer's, and, and calcium and magnesium were depressed. Uh, selenium and nonmetal was the same in either, either case. Um, and it turned, other research has shown that these metals form, form complexes, which then generate more free radicals around these complexes, and so oxidative stress is definitely a part of, of, of the Alzheimer's uh, uh, progression. Uh, Anti-inflammatory drugs uh, I th have been shown to be inversely correlated or be protective against Alzheimer's, and I think that's because they're fighting the, the, the inflation, in, inflammation, which is one of the, risk, one of the consequences of, of free radical production. Um, anyway, the, the, um, I got um, covered by Dan Rather and CNN. I had a press conference in DC, uh, hired a press agent, and had all the people come in. and. Um, uh, it was sort of like hitting a home run the first time at bat, so I was hooked after that to continue doing the research. And the Alzheimer's Association put out a press release saying, well, you can't believe these results. We don't know who this guy is. Um, he doesn't work for the pharmaceutical companies. The doctor is, doesn't work for us, so, so forget it. <laughs> and um, and um, research at Columbia University, based on what I told them, confirmed it in 2000 without giving me credit, which I, I, I criticized them for, and they sort of tried to say, well, we didn't do anything wrong. but. They're just trying to get credit and more funding. And same with Rush Presbyterian Hospital on the fish. But it, it certainly, it's, it's, the thing to do was to get this idea planted in the uh, minds of the researchers and the public. And it has, it's now well accepted, even by the Alzheimer's Association, that a healthy diet is, is a way to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. Here are some of the uh, data uh, that I published. And what's interesting here is you look at the, the, the three or four dots in a vertical line uh, around 130. Those are different European countries that have a different amount of fish in the diet. So then the Nordic countries actually have the lower values and the Mediterranean countries have the higher values because the fish is fighting the effects of the, the fat and other things. In fact, if I put it in a, a, a multiple linear regression, I get much more of a straight line, uh, leaving out the, the uh, Asian and, and, and African countries. So it was a very strong correlation. Um, but then we had, and in fact, in my, my paper, I did talk about the criteria for causality and showed that I thought they were all satisfied. Of course, it took the medical system five years to, to agree that they were satisfied, but um, it was important to try to do that. Uh, it turns out that Alzheimer's disease and coronary heart disease, or, or ischemic heart disease, have many of the same risk factors. Uh, age, uh, the APOE epsilon-4, cholesterol, diabetes, uh, homocysteine, a homocysteine is a case where Kilmer McC 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 McCulley identified as a risk for heart disease, and as a result, he got fired and put in, in, in blackballed and couldn't find a job for a couple of years. Now it's fairly well, fairly well accepted. A um, number of other factors. There are risk reduction factors, the anti-inflammatory substances, antioxidants, possibly calcium, um, dietary restriction, red wine, perhaps. Uh, on the other hand, uh, India has very high rates of heart disease and very low rates of, al of Alzheimer's disease. So it turns out there they have a very high amount of simple carbohydrates in the diet, very little fat, and very little protein. So they can clog their arteries and get the coronary heart disease, but they don't seem to have, being on, I guess, caloric restricted diet, they're not getting as much of the oxidative stress affecting the brain. So they have a low risk for Alzheimer's disease. Some other people think it's also the, the spices in the uh, in curry that may play a role. I, I think it's more the dietary fact, gross dietary factors. Uh, here's an interesting study um, that was written up in um, uh, one of the um, uh, di uh, dietary and food books we uh, magazines we get on a monthly basis. I forget the name of it, but it's also written up in the medical literature. Uh, back in the 60s, coronary heart disease rates in Finland were very, very high and were linked to diets high in fat, low in fruits and vegetables. So in 1971, I get a kick out of this, the citizens of one of the regions, North Karelia, the region with the highest heart disease rate, petitioned the government for help. And under the leadership of Pekka Puska, who was then a 27-year-old MD with a master's degree in social science, dietary changes were instituted with 10 to 20 percent reductions in fat consumption and two to fold increases in fruit and vegetable consumption. They also added selenium to the fertilizers and tripled the intake of selenium. 
coronary heart disease rates plunged 75 to 82 percent and life expectancy increased by seven years. Dr. Puska is now Director General of Finland's National Public Health Institute. Uh, I don't know if we have similar stories in America. Uh, I don't think this thing happens here. Does Smart Life Forum need to do something like that? Yeah. It's the health they need, but plus funding to buy vegetables and fruits? Well, it's stop eating as much fat and eating. Why do they need the government to help them? Well, they need somebody in authority. Uh, I mean, we need somebody in authority to tell us what to do, don't we? Uh, I mean, uh, they, they, I guess they need an expert opinion. Um, they were living, I guess, up there, uh, fat is what you need to sort of survive the winters. And so sort of the national diet was a high-fat diet, and you can't grow vegetables there, and they didn't realize uh, the problems it was creating um, in their national diet. So why do you triple selenium by curiosity? Well, it's a good, anti a good free radical trap. Uh, so it's good for fighting uh, avian f bird flu, uh, fighting prostate cancer. It uh, has a number of good, uh, good effects. Um, carbohydrates. Uh, they are also an important risk factor for heart disease. Uh, the, um, um, as we mentioned earlier, I, I reported this, and it was interesting. Not only did the Heart Association, when I had a press release, a press conference in D.C., not only did the Heart Association fly as president up from Florida to rain on my parade, but also um, Ron Krauss, who is the in Berkeley professor in Berkeley, who I understand is very heavy set was the chairman of the nutrition committee for the Heart Association. And he put out a press release saying, don't believe this, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, he's an atmospheric scientist and a physicist, he can't possibly be giving good dietary advice to the American public. Well, it turns out, I read it later in Mary Nestle's book, that the American Heart Association had bought into the fat causes heart disease paradigm in the 60s and 70s, and in the 90s they were selling the American Heart Association seal of approval for low-fat food. Never mind if they replaced the fat with sugar and if the sugar was causing as much heart disease as the fat was. And uh, so that's why they had to rain on my parade. Um, um, okay, uh, now let's just, just an aside here that um, in terms of cancer, I think that diet, smoking, and alcohol are the primary risk factors uh, in the developing countries with carcinogens contributing only a small portion of the risk. Uh, and this I find by sort of comparing uh, the, the rates around the, the various countries and in the United States. However, I will admit that there are some things, um, pesticide uh, farmers who use a lot of pesticides, say Mexico, will get elevated risk of breast cancer and some other cancers. On the other hand, pesticide uh, applicators in Ohio and North Carolina actually have reduced risk of cancer. Um, uh, I was also reading about um, water supply in America and what, what water supply does in terms of cancer. Turns out it's accepted by the, the water people that you may have 10,000 people a year in the country dying from bladder cancer from the uh, organochlorides that get in the water treatment system. I mean, if you put in chlorine and have organics, organic uh, compounds there, they can mix and, and become carcinogenic. And 10,000 deaths a year from bladder cancer from that it just doesn't phase the, the, uh, the system. Um, EMF is probably playing a role in brain cancer and other tumors, um, but um, uh, it's, hard to, it, it's hard to look around the country and say, here's a polluted part of the country like Louisiana or Mississippi, and then try to find a, a, a highly elevated um, cancer rates. On the other hand, non hodgkin lymphoma, leukemia, and perhaps renal or kidney cancer appear to be elevated in the middle third of the country, going left to right, which is where we have a lot of the corn production, and so it could be the herbicides and the pesticides that, that are getting into the water or the air or the, or the food there that's playing a role. So there are cases, but I think one first has to peel away the effect of diet, uh, smoking, and, and alcohol to find some of these other um, uh, factors. Prostate cancer um, is very common in northern European countries, but very rare in Southeast Asian countries. So this is a clue that, that uh, diet and lifestyle uh, uh, appear to play a very important role. Latitude. Well, latitude too. Um, although Japan has maybe one, and Korea are the same latitude as we are, and have one-tenth the prostate cancer rate. So, and they get a lot of their vitamin D from fish, um, as well as from sun. So in my studies, I've identified milk and other animal products as the primary risk factors, 
with onions, fish, vegetable proteins, and vitamin D as risk reduction factors. And here's uh, some of the data to look at. You've got the countries on the left, you've got the prostate cancer mortality rates, Korea with four. I gave a talk in Korea a few years, three or four years ago, and one of the men, uh, professor in the audience asked, what's the prostate? I mean, that shows you how unaware they are of having to be concerned about it uh, there. Uh, and I think it wasn't, wasn't just a language problem. Uh, Japan with 22 uh, per 100,000 per year. These, these are rates, uh, age-adjusted rates in the countries. Uh, Greece and Italy are starting to get around 50, 70. But the United States, 103, and Sweden, 131. So we have this large variation by country. And if you look at the animal energy, um, you start with 121 calories um, per day per person in the national diet in Korea. And you get almost 10 to eight, and eight or nine times that in the United States. Uh, vegetable protein is higher in Korea and Japan, higher in Korea, not so high in Japan. On the other hand, Japan has fish. Fish is a good source of vitamin D, selenium, and iodine. Uh, milk protein, very little milk in uh, Korea and Japan. You get milk in Greece, Italy, United States, and, and, and uh, Sweden. Onions, um, turns out they're somewhat variable. Um, so anyway, it's, it's looking at these kind of comparisons. There are laboratory studies showing that onions and the other allium family vegetables are very beneficial in fighting many types of cancer. I have an article, uh, uh, an essay on that on my website. And there was another paper that came out on prostate cancer just this month from a uh, group in the United States where they did a very similar study and again found that animal energy was a very important risk factor, onions a risk reduction factor. So it's, it's what you get when you look at these kind of data. Yeah, you can see that. This is the uh, prostate cancer um, rates in um, uh, Japan as a function of milk. As they kept adding more milk to the uh, diet, the prostate cancer rates uh, went up by a factor of two and a half. And this is the sort of thing that it's not just milk that was changing, but, but there is a correlation here. What's on the x-axis? x-axis is the prostate cancer mortality rates age-adjusted in any one year. So I started, it was probably back in the early 60s, at around 12, uh, up to around 20, 27, 28, in the, uh, around, the, around 2000. And, but I plotted it. See, the milk went up and the, and the prostate cancer went up. And I, I think I've had a 15-year yeah, lag between the milk uh, levels and the prostate cancer levels. Because measuring milk consumption or just saying that's milk supply. supply. And supply. what, yeah, and what I assume in my, um, my, my uh, studies is that about 70% of what's in the supply is actually consumed by the, the people in the country. And maybe it's 72, 73, it's, but I think it's a fairly good assumption. Colon cancer, um, it's a uh, disease linked to consumption of animal products, especially meat. Uh, and as countries increase their animal uh, intake, uh, product intake, colon cancer rates increase. Uh, high fiber helps, but it's really more sort of a secondary uh, factor that, that's really the meat is the, the risk factor and the, the, the fiber can maybe dilute that or, or displace it. And I, I'll show an example here from, um, from Bulgaria. But smoking and alcohol are also risk factors. And I had two colleagues back in uh, Hampton, Virginia, which is where NASA Langley is. It's not by where the CIA is that, that's far away. But um, uh, one liked his beer and the other liked his cigarettes. And they both got colon cancer in their 50s. So um, they're both thin people. Uh, here's Bulgaria. And you have here now the year on the uh, bottom and the, the colorectal cancer on the, on the left. And what they were doing is adding more uh, animal products uh, to the diet, going more Western in their diet, and um, um, nearly tripling their colon cancer rates. Now, you've got a lot of graphs here where you're calling out one thing that changed during that period, but lots of things changed during that period. Right. That's the problem with these studies is you don't, you can just pick out, you can pick one, but we don't really know. Well, I can go to the medical literature and I can get papers from South Africa, papers from China or Japan, other papers that actually look at the mechanisms and, and, and find that meat is what's most highly correlated with, with, uh, with the colon cancer. I mean, they under, um, but you really have to find a country where it went down, like that amazing example in Finland. Yeah, well... Or, or where... Okay, what we're dealing with here is observational studies. What the medical system wants is intervention studies. Uh, now, they just came out with this half a billion dollar World's Health, Women's Health Initiative study on calcium and vitamin D. They gave the, the women 400 IU per day of vitamin D 
and maybe uh, eight or twelve hundred IU to be, uh, eight or twelve hundred milligrams of calcium per day. And it didn't find anything. Well, it turns out many were already taking calcium, and excess calcium doesn't do any good, and the amount of vitamin D they were providing was too low to have any effect. Turns out if they looked at the people at the beginning of the study and took those in the lower, in the different uh, tertiles or quartiles or quintiles, they found that there was a correlation in, prostate, in colon cancer rates later in the study based on what they had at the beginning of the study. So um, I guess my point is, why in the hell do a half a billion dollar study without doing a good ecologic study first um, and looking at the mechanisms uh, and thinking of ramifications? And this is, you, you might consider this front-end information. Uh, as I say, the, the health system does not like to accept it as, uh, as anything to base policy on, but I think there's a lot there. And, and uh, um, in my studies, I, I, I look at, when I do these studies, I look at the correlations between many factors, I do a multivariate uh, study, and so I look at the trade-offs between uh, meat and animal products and, and alcohol and, and, and so on. But I'm showing a representative example here that, that shows the trend. And, and For example, in this study, you could probably list dozens of things that all increase or decrease during that period. Sure, this is a representative example. This is a, a picture. Now, for breast cancer, um, I did a study there in which I, I, I looked carefully at a number of factors. And what I found was that the animal products, the fraction of energy derived from animal products, had the highest correlation. Um, with um, solar ultraviolet B radiation uh, having a uh, being risk reduction factor, uh, with energy from uh, alcohol being risk reduction a risk factor, and fish being a risk reduction factor, and these uh, well I'll show here here's the model where I have the, these factors included, and latitude is an index for for vitamin D, and you see there's a fairly good correlation, and now I, I've, you know is I left off the variables that didn't seem to have much uh, explanatory power, and you see there's a pretty good fit uh, to the model I've developed. And we do the same thing, we take just the, um, uh, I think this is uh, 16 countries more or less in Europe. Now going back to breast cancer in Marin County, which is always a topic of, of discussion, I've, I've been involved in a number of meetings with the Marin breast, County, uh, breast cancer people, and um, I keep bringing up vitamin D and they just keep, they just look at me with glazed eyes, well what is vitamin D and why, why should we be getting vitamin D? They just don't understand it. But there was a paper that came out about a year ago um, on breast cancer in Marin County and they found that one of the important risk factors up there was the amount of alcohol consumed. And alcohol is a very important risk factor for breast cancer. Among other things, it helps build, uh, helps uh, generate blood vessels around tumors. Uh, now, if Marin County is next to the wine capital of the country, so it's not surprising that affluent people will be drinking a lot of uh, wine. They're probably also eating a lot of meat. Uh, they probably in, didn't have many children. They probably use sunscreen when they go out of doors, etc. So they probably have a whole bunch of risk factors. It may be that EMF fields uh, play a role as well. But I think you've got to sort of look at what's known and sort of uh, factor those in before you go looking for pollutants under the bed, which is what the people in Marin County are always trying to do. Um, I have the data. I, I, I can't say right now, but um, uh, if you contact me, I can give you the information. Harvard has found the same thing. They've done a meta-analysis of alcohol and, and um, um, uh, breast cancer. Uh, here, let's see. Uh, I want to go into the data for eight geopolitical regions of the world. Actually, I only used seven of them. I left off uh, Australia and the, the island countries. But if you look here, I've taken representative diseases, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, stomach cancer. And we're looking at established market economies, which is essentially Europe and the United States, um, countries like that, the former Soviet Union, India, China, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and Middle East. So you can see that in the, uh, on the left, you have the high rates, and as you go towards the right, you generally have lower rates, except for China, where you have high stomach cancer rates, but in the Middle East, you have very low rates of, of all these cancers. So this is an indication that, that if you start examining, comparing the different regions, you might be able to find out what, what correlates with, with the risk of these various diseases. We can also look at other diseases, cerebral vascular disease or strokes, uh, heart disease, osteoarthritis, <coughs> rheumatoid arthritis, and diabetes. 
And again, you see uh, large variations. The Soviet Union has very high uh, stroke rates. Well, they have a lot of smoking, a lot of alcohol, a lot of stress. Uh, they're just in bad shape. Um, uh, heart disease, Sub-Saharan Africa has the lowest heart disease rates. They have starvation diets, uh, they don't live that long. I mean, these are age-adjusted, but um, uh, sometimes the age adjustment doesn't always pick up things. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, only six and three in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and Middle East, uh, 53 in established market economies. Uh, the paper I did on rheumatoid arthritis found that, well, it looked at a period from 1975 to 1985 in Europe. It looked at disease statistics for rheumatoid arthritis that somebody else had tabulated uh, hospital stays, the hospital discharges, time lost from work. And I lived in Germany in 1971 to 73, and I remember it was a time of deprivation. Uh, people wore, wore the same dark clothes day in and day out. Uh, they lived in small apartments, etc. Well, it turns out by 1970, they finally got enough ahead economically to start putting more meat in the diet. And so they, they doubled the meat consumption. And lo and behold, in all these countries, there was a kink in the rheumatoid arthritis expression. And it's related to, it appears to be related to the arachidonic acid in, in, in animal, in meat, uh, which gives rise to inflammation. So it's, it's some sort of infectious uh, cause of rheumatoid arthritis. It's sort of like you've got a wound, and if you add salt to it, or in this case, arachidonic acid, you can aggravate it to where you get, become uncomfortable. And it turns out the fish oil helps reduce the uh, inflammation from, uh, from uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so here's some of the dietary supply data. And you can, um, one thing that's brought out in, in the China study is that about 12% of the energy derived from protein is what's standard in national diets um, worldwide. You have Indian China with, and, and Sub-Saharan Africa with 9 or 10%, um, but they have their sort of, uh, uh, sort of limited diets. I mean, they have deficient diets there. So it's, I guess between 10 and 12% is, is what is reasonable. So this is reason to think that the, the high protein, high fat Atkins diet is not really good on a long-term basis. Um, it's just not a, a natural diet that humans uh, have evolved with or, or have, can uh, seem to accommodate. Uh, the fat, you notice here that the um, United States, uh, I've put in data now for the United States, with 37% of the calories from fat. Um, India is 14, 15, China 14. Um, uh, where do we have? Okay, uh, but you see there's, there's quite a bit of variability there. And um, one can go through and try to look at these and find out what the correlations are, um, the very... I'm sorry, but you know, you told us that carbohydrates are bad, mm -hmm. proteins are bad, <coughs> fats are bad. What are we going to eat? No, I didn't say proteins are bad. I say e excess proteins are bad. Okay. Uh, I think McDougall gave you an idea of what you can eat. Uh, I don't want to do that. I want to try to give you evidence, um, the book, and so on. I want to try to give you the tools to which you can, if you... I mean, for example, there's a book out called Eating Right for Your Blood Type by Peter J. Diodamo, and I've heard him lecture, and I've talked to his people after the talk. I, I said, how do you know that what you're saying is, is really correct? He said, we don't. We, we don't. we don't do any you know, follow-up studies on these people. But I think in those cases, if somebody has a disease condition and they have a, bad, a diet that's not right for them for whatever reason, they then go to this book and find another diet and change. Maybe it's the right diet, and maybe because of the genetic makeup, their own personal history, they may do better on that diet. Um, and um, but I think I think it's your I think it's your food supply also. I mean, when you're talking about meat, there's grass-fed meat and there's grain-fed meat. There's nutrient value coming out of soils and tons of soil, like the Savo King Valley, has got to be depleted. So you make these kind of statements, and you got to back up what kind of food you're eating because most of the time it's not food anymore. Yeah, it's agribusiness. Yeah. And when you eat when you eat now, you're eating 25% of corn, which you're eating right there. I'm going to discuss that in a minute. Yeah. That's what he's talking about. Right. You know. Steve. Right. It's gathered by a group of researchers who lump everything into a category, which may, may or not be accurate. Right. But you know, basically, what you're saying is that we can learn from this statistically right. by looking at these correlations. We can learn from things, even though the observations may be flawed, the data may be skewed. <coughs> but we can still learn enough to say, well, maybe we should be paying attention to this. Okay. Good point. Isn't that what you were saying yeah. earlier. Yeah, and like you say, there, there are ty different types of fat. And for Alzheimer's disease, some fats are beneficial and some are harmful. So it's, it's um, 
It depends. Another, another thing is your carbohydrate system. In one place there, you talked about simple carbohydrates, right. which is the sugar, complex carbohydrates, which is the starch. Right. And you're using simple carbohydrates related to India, and then the uh, <coughs> diabetic. And, and, and so I, you know, it gets kind of mixed up. Right, right. right. But on the other hand, Japan has 41% of their di- diet has traditionally come from rice and wheat. But they have enough other things in diet to sort of moderate that, whereas India just doesn't. And uh, China maybe is questionable. Um, but uh, let's, let's uh, I mean, this is just some of the uh, summaries, but let's go to the next, on to um, Michael Pollan's book about the cornification of America. And he's pointing out that the primary uh, reason for the obesity epidemic in the U.S. is that President Richard Nixon and his Secretary of Agriculture, Earl Butts, established the farm subsidy system, making it cheaper to buy corn and soybeans than grow them for use in raising livestock. So what happened is all of the livestock were pushed off the farms, and all the farms were converted to growing corn. Uh, It's a very good book, just came out about a, a month ago. Um, okay, so now we, we have enough acreage in the United States that grows, it has gone up to producing two and a half times as much corn as it did before. So we now have corn fields 350 miles on a side in the United States, twice the size of the state of New York. Over 60% of the corn raised in America is processed through livestock, chickens, cows, and pigs. Much of the rest is converted to high fructose corn syrup. And he also points out that, that fast food production uses 10 times as much energy from fossil fuel as it delivers in energy or calories to the consumer. We talk about uh, the, the, uh, the, the fossil fuels used in fertilizer, in transportation, in marketing, processing, um, uh, et cetera. It's just uh, a very inefficient. I mean, it used to be that you used... Without the, subsidization, it couldn't, uh, wouldn't be Right, without wars in Iraq and, 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 and things like that, and, and subsidized... Uh, gasoline and, and so on. In fact, now the farmers are beginning to lose their profit margin, which was already very minimal because the gas prices are going up for them. It used to be that a farmer could go out and, and use the sun as a source of energy and use photosynthesis to generate the corn, the grass, and so on. That's out the door for now, as well as the nutrients in the soil. Um, so Americans are being induced to consume about 200 calories a day and more than they require, which is fueling the obesity epidemic. And fructose is especially insidious since it does not involve insulin in, in the processing, so there's no warning that excessive amounts of sugar are being consumed. Uh, if I would eat a, drink a glass of orange juice in an empty stomach, I'd get a reactive hypoglycemic reaction because it would, the insulin would get rid of the glucose. But with fructose, uh, which is in Coke and, and in other beverages, uh, you don't get that, that uh, hint. But instead, the, the, um, uh, that's for processed in liver, uh, by the liver into triglycerides and becomes one of the main risk factors for, for coronary heart disease, which is why women who love the sugar uh, were getting a lot of heart disease from, from, uh, rather than, than from the fat, which they, would, they, could, they could handle. Now, unfortunately... Uh, in the 19th century, uh, corn was also grown to excess um, west of the Appalachian Mountains. And the easiest way to bring the corn to market was to produce whiskey, which was easy to transport by rail. So in 1830, alcohol consumption was per capita triple what it is today. And the problems of alcoholic beverage consumption in the 19th century led to prohibition in 1920. Uh, not here to argue the merits of a prohibition, but I, I just wonder how long we have to wait until we have some way to deal with the modern corn epidemic. Uh, of course, we all know that, that the problem here in America is we have um, the priorities are, are in uh, treatment rather than prevention um, and, and testing and screening and so on. In two years, we'll be using ethanol from corn to drive our car. Uh, yeah, right. Or sugar cane if they would lower the let Brazil import the sugar. But there are farmers who are growing corn now for the purpose of making ethanol for farms. But I think it's still not energy efficient. I think yeah, they... 60 Minutes said that they use up too much external energy to make that into ethanol and make that really viable. Yeah. I'm sure the drug, the uh, petroleum industry is putting that out. Yeah. It'll be subsidized. Well, no. 
Okay, let's uh, go away from diet to a subject I've been working on a little more carefully closely the last few years, uh, sunlight. So if we have, as I said, there's good evidence the American diet is not design, designed with optimal health in mind, but we have an antidote in the form of solar ultraviolet B radiation. Yes? One more thing on the corn. He said that the corn now transfers petro, petrochemicals to you as an energy source as opposed to solar energy. Right. And the corn is not the corn that you envision eating off the cob. Right. It's not like that. It's, different. it's a commodity product. It's a grade two corn, which is just a simple right. carbohydrate. Right. Yeah. Very good book. I recommend it. He's giving lectures on writing quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, in terms of vitamin D and cancer, we have 18 types of cancer that have been identified as being vitamin D sensitive in terms of my ecologic studies and the work at Harvard. Um, here is the, the type of picture that uh, Cedric Garland and Frank Garland saw in 1980, seeing that the colon cancer rates were much lower in the southwest than in the northeast. And what they plotted here is the contours of sunlight hours per year. Um, high in the southwest, low in the northeast. Uh, the red is up to 30 um, uh, case, uh, deaths per 100,000 per year. The blue is down to 8 or uh, 10 deaths per 100,000 year. So we have almost a factor of 3 variation if, from regions of the country, but about a factor of 2 if you take large averages. Uh, what I use is something a little different. I use July UVB data from NASA satellite, but you can see it has the same sort of pattern, that it's much higher uh, UVB at the same latitude to the west of the Rockies than to the east in part because uh, the surface elevation is higher, in part because as the winds come from the ocean, try to cross the mountains, they push the stratosphere higher and make the ozone layer thinner. Um, Edward Gorham and, and uh, Cedric Garland and I have pr presented a paper where we looked at a lot of the, the observational papers, or actually these were, I think, case control papers or cohort papers on uh, amount of vitamin D consumed per day and the re relative risk of, of col colorectal cancer. And it turns out that by extrapolating it, one can uh, estimate that 1,000 IU of vitamin D per day would lead to a 50% reduction in, in colorectal cancer. Looking at in terms of, of serum levels, um, it appears that the, the value is 38 nanograms or almost 100 nanomoles per milliliter, or nanomoles per liter uh, would be the 50% uh, reduction point. I've had, got a vitamin D meter from uh, Steve Mackin of Solar Meter uh, Company back east. I've been going on my roof every sunny day in San Francisco for the past year making measurements of the vitamin D potential, production potential at solar noon, which right, right now is around 1.15 in the afternoon in daylight saving time, otherwise around 12.15 in the noon uh, day. So in the summer, one can produce, if one has 10% of the body exposed, that's face, hands, maybe some of the arms, one can produce about 65 international units of vitamin D per minute in the, in the noonday sun. Uh, you can produce, if you have this amount of, of, of skin exposed, you can produce about 1500 IU in about 23 minutes and then you sort of saturate your, your, amount of your production of vitamin D from your cholesterol in, in your skin if you're a fair skinned person in San Francisco at that part, time of the day. Uh, if you, where we are now, um, we're probably more like 55, uh, 55 to 60 um, international units per minute uh, yeah, in, in the middle of the day. If you want to produce more, you just expose more of your body. Uh, maybe you only get out once a week, so maybe you go out in your bathing suit on the weekend and, and spend half an hour out in the sun and produce a week's supply of, of vitamin D. So it is fairly easy to produce your vitamin D from, from sunlight if it's not foggy and cloudy and too cold, et cetera, for, for at least a uh, half or two thirds of the year. Yes? On the previous slide, you had the layer of vegetables or layer of vegetables. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the um, different periods of hypocrisy. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Reinhold Veith in Toronto has looked at this very carefully. Uh, a, a lifeguard being out of doors in, in, in Florida every day would make 15,000 IU per day. Uh, lifeguards don't have a, a toxic problem. Uh, he's found that, that the, our toxicity, the toxicity, toxicity level seems to be about 40,000 IU per day. The national meta, the... That's not a problem, uh, 
I had 82 a couple years ago, and I backed off to around 60. But um, I mean, the problem there is a problem with pulling the calcium out of the bones, uh, maybe calcifying the arteries. But uh, Phil uh, Miller, if you looked into this, is do you think there's a problem? Yeah, see, the cal uh, vitamin D has a trade-off with, with uh, parathyroid hormone. The, the more vitamin D, uh, 25 OHD, the lower the PTH. The PTH actually pulls the calcium out, and the vitamin D help puts it in. So if you have, can raise your vitamin D, you can lower the PTH and keep your bones in better balance. Did you, did you, have, did you hear Bill mention vitamin K before the end? That's another story, yeah. uh, but I, I don't know that story yet. Yeah. summer, she found that it was rare to actually get good exposure because of the pollution. So San Francisco may not be a very good place to measure because of the onshore breeze blowing the pollution across the mm. bay, but in an urban area at low altitude that the UVB may be absorbed by pollutants in the atmosphere to a, to a severe extent. What year was she doing those uh, studies? I believe it was about six or seven years ago, Bill, do you remember that? Seven years ago. Yeah. Huh. Well, I admit that, that, that the pollution is a problem. It does block yeah, UV. She, she presented here and discussed that finding that, that okay. even in the summers, there were many days of summer in Oakland where in Oakland, downtown Oakland, there was no UVB. Yeah, well, I've even written a paper saying that part of the reason for high breast cancer rate in the Bay Area is sun and uh, fog and clouds in the summer. So I, I go along with that. What's the half life for vitamin D? Uh, around four to eight weeks. So if, uh, like in, Fran in France, they don't, in many European countries do not fortify the foods with vitamin D and they don't like supplements. So in France, the adolescents who play in the summer in the field, in, in, the, in the yards, um, get up to around, well, high level, and then it goes down to one quarter or one fifth of that in the winter because they're just not supplementing or fortifying, yes? I just want to point out that we've had this discussion of electromagnetic radiation and whether or not it has any effect. In the case of vitamin D, you've got electromagnetic radiation that has a definite effect. This is one of the few cases where they, there's hardly any doubt. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that the, uh, the book, the 120-year diet put out by, uh, by the people at uh, UCLA. Walford. Uh, yeah, Walford has said, get out and run 16 miles a week. Well, if you do that, you shouldn't be shocked if you get a lot of vitamin D. Right, right. That's all. Right. Uh, Jim? Yeah, would you uh, recommend again taking a shower? I mean, just before you go out and come because you wouldn't have any oils in the process. And if you had taken a shower with lots of soap and so forth, would you recommend like an oil sometimes, like olive oil to put on your body? And would that enhance the production of vitamin D? I haven't really thought about that. I don't use soap in my face anymore. Um, uh, Chris Sullivan mentioned that. that Soap does leach the oils out, and that could be a, uh, an important factor in, in both skin, preserving the skin and protecting it, and possibly in producing vitamin D. Uh, let me go on and try to go through a few more slides here, and then um, here's what happens during the day. The dermatologists say, uh, go out before 10 and after 4. Unfortunately, if you go out before 10, you get less vitamin D, uh, UVB, and you get U more UVA. And it turns out that UVA, the longer wave UV, is really the risk factor for melanoma and, and basal cell carcinoma whereas vitamin D actually fights melanoma. So the dermatologists don't have the story quite right, and uh, we're trying to set that uh, record straight. But you can still, at 10 o'clock, you make um, three quarters as much uh, vitamin D as you do at noon. Uh, turns out there are many risk factors for melanoma, including uh, the long wave UV, sunburning, taking vacation to sunny locations without preparing the skin. There are several papers showing that that, that uh, melanoma rates increase in proportion to the amount of air travel or mi vehicle miles traveled. You can imagine that if you live in a place like here and just go out every day, you get, a little bit, you get adjusted to the sun in this location. But if you come from, uh, say, Wisconsin and go down to the Caribbean in the spring or go to Yucatan, your skin's not ready for that. You're going to get burned and you're going to get a risk for melanoma. Turns out that a high-fat, low, low antioxidant diet is also a major risk factor for melanoma because melanoma comes from the free radicals produced by the UVA in the skin. 
um, basal cell carcinoma has very similar uh, factors. Sunscreen is an overrated uh, product and gives a false sense of security. In fact, a, a law firm in San Diego has sued and it's used a class action lawsuit against the sunscreen manufacturers for giving false information to the consumers. It blocks the erythemal UV, which is out to 325 nanometers. Erythemal means it causes reddening or sunburning. But it does not block the longer wave UV uh, radiation very well at all. Sunscreen, do, if you have a factor of SPF 15, that means it's letting through about 6% as much of the vitamin D producing UVB as it would normally, and so you're producing much less vitamin D. And so if you're going to use sunscreen so you can stay out and play tennis or whatever, uh, you should go out for a few minutes uh, before you apply the sunscreen to produce your vitamin D, and then you can apply your, your, your sunscreen. Turns out that if you tan, you can get a, a protection factor of two or four, which means you can stay out two to four times as long before burning, and that's going to give you a good protection against UVA and UVB. Um, just mentioned one study I'm doing here quickly. Um, the, most of my studies have been on, on mortality rates. It turns out if you, uh, there's some new data on incidence rates, and incidence rates show, again, a very strong correlation uh, with solar UVB. And what it appears is that if I look at the, the southwest desert versus northeast, there's about a 7% differential for all cancers combined, other than um, lung cancer, uh, that can be attributed to the, to the UV uh, B vitamin D. Um, turns out obesity is also playing a role now in cancer risk, but it's, it's and interestingly, obesity is a risk reduction factor for bladder cancer. Uh, maybe it's absorbing toxins that would otherwise go to the bladder, I don't know. It's, I'm not sure they know either. It appears from what I can tell that screening plays very little role in really reducing overall cancer mortality rates. Uh, no matter what the Cancer Society says in terms of um, fecal blood, sigmoidoscopy, mammography, uh, whatever, um, they really ought to be emphasizing diet and, and, and vitamin D, but they really rather make money selling mammograms and, and radiation and invasive studies. I met a poor woman down in San Diego who had um, um, perforation of her intestine from a sigmoid uh, operation, and she nearly died from that. So that's a risk factor. And one in every one or 2,000 people gets perforated with a sigmoidoscopy. So, you know, and mammography has x-rays. Maybe that's a risk factor for breast cancer. So I don't know how long it's going to take for the medical system to say, you know, maybe vitamin D like Harvard and we say is the way to go instead of uh, the other things. Which one? The last one. About screening. The last point in that slide. Oh, it's work I'm doing, and, 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 and there are other studies that, that question it as well. Steve's nodding his head. So it's, um, for example, I, I, I didn't show it here, I, I, but there's a very interesting uh, curve. If you look at prostate cancer incidence and mortality rates in the United States, there's a peak, a doubling of prostate cancer incidence rates peaking around 1990. If you look at the trend line, when they introduced PSA testing, they doubled the, the incidence rate, and then it sort of went down when they realized you, you have to take PSA tests with a grain of salt. But at the same time, prostate cancer mortality rates went up by 33%, or uh, about 30%. Now, to me, that indicates that perhaps they're doing more aggressive treatment of prostate cancer based on the PSA testing, which then resulted in adverse effects. I mean, I can't prove it. It's just an ecologic study. But, you know, it went down again after they stopped relying on PSA testing as much. So there's, there's evidence like that, that 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 can be brought into this kind of study. I can also, I have the data on mammography and sigmoidoscopy and so on by state, and I can put these in the same spreadsheets and find very little effect uh, on the mortality rates. Uh, Phil's passed out the Giovannucci study, and... Uh, I do like to take credit for introducing him to the idea that it wasn't just dietary vitamin D that plays a role, but sunshine. Well, actually, I'm kind of curious, why wouldn't you just want to get all your vitamin D through a dietary source? I mean, well, it's just a supplement as opposed to the sun. Okay. Uh, it depends whether at individual level or population level. At the individual level, supplements is probably the best. On the other hand, if you have a, an active lifestyle, which includes being out of doors, you want to have some sort of tan so you can, you want to be able to enjoy the outdoors without always lathering up with sunscreen, which is counterproductive. Well, if you're taking a supplement, it's not. You've heard that you're not exposed to the sunscreen. You're getting the UVA, which is going to give rise to melanoma and basal cell carcinoma, which the sunscreen doesn't block. 
at the population level, uh, there's problems. Like in, in Europe, they do not like to fortify food with anything. Uh, so they're not putting vitamin D, uh, they're giving cod liver oil in, in, in the Nordic countries, and, uh, but you don't have much fortification else. It's very hard to get supplements in Europe because they're controlled. You have to go to the pharmacist and ask for the 1,000 IU per day of, of vitamin D. You can't just buy it over the counter. Uh, and then you have Cancer Research UK, which first of all denies that vitamin D plays any role in cancer, and when they're confronted with evidence that it does, like from uh, Cedric Garland, they say, well, then don't take supplements because that's nat not natural, get it from sunlight, but there's not enough sunlight in England to produce the vitamin D, and they've railed against that as well. So they're, they're really sort of schizophrenic on the whole thing and they haven't dealt with it properly. So have you done a survey of all these Asian women that walk around with gloves and masks and headgear and do they want to have any sun whatsoever in their life? There are many studies on that, especially in Europe, and they're very, very vitamin D deficient, even in Kuwait and, and other places. And it's, it's the sort of thing that it, 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 it's going to get you in terms of osteoporosis or increased cancer rate or something if you have a bad diet. It's not something where you, you, you have headaches or, or, or feel lethargic or something. It, it's knowing if you're vitamin D deficient, you don't really have the warning signs like um, you would expect. So they, they, they have a major problem. They have much more TB from being dark skinned and veiled in, in England, for example and more osteoporosis, they have more rickets, rickets are being born, uh, children in, being raised in, in North Carolina and, and, and Michigan, uh, more rickety uh, children in, in England, so it is a definite problem. Um, there's a new paper just came out of England uh, showing that survival uh, of cancer for uh, female breast cancer and lung cancer was related to the season of discovery. This is following on the heels of the studies in, in Norway that have found that colon, uh, prostate, and breast cancer, and Hodgkin's disease, you all have, you have about a 30% longer 18-month survival rate for discovery in the fall than you do for discovery in winter or spring, which they relate to the summertime uh, production of vitamin D. Um, so the, what this, the implication of this, and I'm doing my own study here, uh, let me show you the, um, I'm finding that a number of cancers, bladder, breast, colorectal, laryngeal, and all cancers, as well as leukemia, Hodgkin, and non hodgkin lymphoma, uh, have survival rates that are linked to the amount of solar UVB in different parts of, of England. We have data for 100 different uh, areas. What's interesting, though, if you look at cancer incidence for, for colorectal cancer, for men, the highest rates are in the lower UV part of the northern part of the country. The higher rates for the women are in the southern part. Well, it turns out you have much more smoking and lower socioeconomic class in the northern part, and smoking is a risk factor for colon cancer, colorectal cancer. So the men who are more like, two and a half times more likely to smoke than women have the colorectal cancers that are skewed one direction, whereas the women who tend to be, the, the higher the socioeconomic status, the more meat in the diet, I mean more alcohol, so they have the uh, something as other. So if you're trying to look at, at vitamin D in a low vitamin D country, uh, UVB country, you wouldn't find it in the incidence rates. But if you divide the mortality rate by the incidence rate, both males and females have the same slope. In other words, the survival rate, the mortality rate is down to 60% for men in the south versus 67% in the north, down to 47% for women versus 56% in the two. So the survival very much depends on the amount of UVB. And this is what I'm working up for, for submission uh, in the very near future. And it will go along with the other, the other study was a temporal uh, variation, this is spatial variation. So this should now get Cancer Research UK's attention and, and get them off, off the pot. In Australia, we're doing the same thing down there. They for years have, have thought that, well, it's sunny land, you don't need to do anything. Well, they have finally, re about a year ago, revised their, their, their vitamin D uh, position statement. They're now recommending everybody get 400 IU per day in treating bones. They don't realize they have a cancer problem. Well, I'm gonna show them they have a cancer problem. Uh, that um, uh, here, for example, is all cancers in, 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 in um, Australia, the mortality rate for all cancers other than lung cancer is a function of the amount of vitamin D um, produced per day or something in, in uh, this is on the bottom is, oh, this is, okay, this is the amount of number of minutes you have to spend in the sun, summer, sun and winter to produce your, your, your some allot, allotment of vitamin D and you have the cancer rates on the left-hand side. So you see there's a very interesting correlation between the two here. 
And what I'm showing here, a little busy again, but the flat line, the red line, is for their summer. And it turns out everybody has about the same time, almost the same amount of time for making their vitamin D. But in the winter, there's a very, very strong difference. So what this is saying that, can't, that the, the, the slip slap slop people are correct, that in summer there's not so much of a problem. It's really the winter time that's the problem. And in that case, probably the supplementation would be the way to try to resolve this problem. But they've got to go and recognize that it's 1,000 to 2,000 IU per day and not just uh, 400. So um, we're finding quite a few cancers, and I'm estimating that if everybody had 1,000 IU per day, they would reduce their cancer mortality rate, uh, death rates by 10,000 per year. Uh, so, okay, yes? Is there a seasonal variation with the detection of cancer in Australia? Uh, no. Uh, there, there's very little evidence that the seasonality of presentation is there for any other reason than maybe doctors are on vacation in summer or something. Uh, or the people are on vacation, don't go to see a doctor in summer. But there's no, there doesn't seem to really be much of a seasonality in, in detection, it's more in, the, in, the, um, in the, the survival. Now the dermat I met with a dermatologist in uh, a World Health Organization meeting in um, um, Munich last October, and they were reluctant to accept the, the finding that, that living in a sunny location produce vitamin D from, by, just because you live there. They say, well, maybe in a sunny location they'll go out of doors. Maybe they uh, cover themselves up and don't get much vitamin D. So that spurred me to try to find a, a direct measure of UVB exposure. And I found it in terms of uh, non, diagnosis of non melanoma skin cancer. If you've been diagnosed with non melanoma skin cancer, most likely you've had UV exposure. It also turns out that smoking is a risk factor for both non melanoma skin cancer and for internal cancers. So I had to um, uh, do a little fancy footwork here, but it turns out if I take, for example, colon cancer, um, probably for men, and I, I'm looking at, and this is, they've had diagnosis of non-melanoma skin cancer in many populations, this is 20 or 25 studies, and so we now plot lung cancer risk for colorect, uh, for, for non-melanoma skin, in the population that was also tested for, for colon cancer. And what you see is, that if you go to the lung cancer risk ratio equal one, you have a definite reduction in risk of colon cancer compared to the, to, to not having, uh, being diagnosed as non melanoma skin cancer. So I'm taking this as more direct evidence that sun exposure reduces the risk of colon and other internal cancers. Now, the survival, um, well, of course, there are many other things that, that uh, vitamin D does, uh, helps for. What I've been trying to get um, the medical system to do is try some intervention studies where they'll take people with cancer and say, okay, we're going to put you on a double-blind study, say we're going to give some people 1,000 or 2,000 IU per day and others are going to give you a placebo and want to see whether their survival rate is very, uh, depends on how much vitamin D you're taking. Uh, I'm still having a funny, finding it difficult to get some group that wants to conduct this study, but I'm hopeful that the, the evidence based on the, these ecologic studies is reaching a point where they say, well, maybe there's enough evidence we ought to start doing this trial, which would really confirm uh, that or evaluate whether this has an effect. Finally, to put it all together, an optimal diet and lifestyle for health should be one that optimizes happiness. Happiness includes uh, enjoyment, going with the flow, being in the moment, and service to others. For example, it's hard to be a vegan and, and, and go with the flow if you go to a dinner party, as I found out. <laughs> So hedonism, um, preparing tasty and nutritious foods in a tasty manner, trying a variety of uh, foods, enjoying the sun and the outdoors. Being in the moment, uh, sharing good food with others, buying from local producers at farmer's markets, and that's one thing that Michael Pollan recommends, growing one's own fruits and vegetables. And service to others, helping the environment, demanding foods grown in a more uh, sustainable manner, eating lower on the food chain, and working for better nutrition in schools. So I don't know if I've given you told you what to eat or what not to eat, but I, I hope I've given you some tools. There's a handout, there's a book here, and uh, I'd be happy, I have my email address, the website on the handout, and if you want to email me, I'd be happy to uh, carry this further. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. I just wind things up here. Okay, I think uh, we'll wind things up here if you have questions. Bill's very accessible, and uh, 
we'll just, uh, well, it take, what, Dave, why don't you bring the question? I just want to say that yeah. I think you're a great example of anti-aging lifestyle. To, to do this as a retirement project. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Okay, so listen, th thanks very much for coming. You know, we yeah. have five books here. Okay, five books and 20 bucks is cheap. Oh. Those are really, yes. really good reads. A very I'll autograph it for another 20. <laughs> 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 Thank you.